Well, thank you for for joining. We've uh, we've actually managed to find another time to do this. First time was was a little bit unsuccessful, but um, I'm I'm glad we've managed to carve out some time to do this. Yeah, no, super excited. Um, um, it's amazing you retire and think, oh, um, I'll take it easy. And you realize you're 34 years old. You need to get a job. Uh, then you start doing, start spinning plates, and before you know it, you've got 37 plates in the air. And then you realise, what am I doing? I'm being a muppet. I'm chasing every tail there is out there. And uh, you speak to some wise old people, and you eventually cut it down to about two or three things. I, I am plural. I think that's a word people use. I others say a portfolio of careers. Um, I do have two or three irons in the fire, um, but I run my own paperback diary still. I know it's all tech world, but I still love a bit of pencil and paper. And um, I, I book things in, go, yeah, yeah, no problem, be free. And that, my week's empty, no problem. Then as the week approaches, it's like, oh, it's, everything's getting it's concertina. It's like a traffic jam on the M25. Just all oh, gets bunched together, and then it's free. And then it's, anyway, yeah, good, great that, to get it, 40 minutes. Is is that um is that a journal that you keep like for is that diarising or is there actually things that you you put down in in your head that no, you, you want to um, get out? We all have obviously we love our mobiles right and we have different formats of comms. So I mean this is really technical. Some people would like let's meet for a drink next week on WhatsApp. I'm, if you WhatsApp me that WhatsApp's my sort of chat mate space. So I have a chat, join in, jump out. I'm in my head, WhatsApp isn't booking a meeting. So I'll often, people go, I'll say to them, can you email me that? They go, what are you on about? Just WhatsApp to you. I said, yeah, yeah. But if it's on the WhatsApp, it's not. Whereas if it's on my big desktop computer, I come out my office, switch my brain on, get the important red book out, get it down, written in, it's good as gold. Then we're in, then we're in, but oh. Don't try and arrange. Anyway, what on earth are we talking about? It's, it's different. Um, I love all comms. I love lots of comms. I love reminders. I never mind being told, are oh, we meeting again at two tomorrow? Four hours later, we're still on for two tomorrow. I've got no issues with that. I don't mind the over-communication side of things. Um, people just need to understand my, uh, as you get older, you become a car- I think you become a caricature of yourself as well. So everything that you have, all your... Uh, quirky idiosyncratic characteristics get even more embedded uh, why i think change at 50 um, is a lot harder than change at 25 yeah what would you say some of your sort of like idiosyncrasies are that you've you've become really aware of um so i think it's all part i've realized about 10 years ago i'm not a ceo but i'm one of the world's best number twos. Uh, wow, yeah, I'm interesting. Not a director of rugby, but I'm a magnificent attack coach. Or for example, so my point being is the massive difference between strategy and tactics. Um, in business, I've aligned myself to a brilliant strategist uh, and who can see, who is a man... What do they say? A wise man is he who can who will plant trees that he knows he won't sit in their shade. Or when you're taking the Chinese on a foreign policy, don't play the don't play a week, don't play a year. They're playing the thousand year game. These guys have been are going to be around a lot longer than us. That book by Tim Marshall, Power of Geography, just to understand psychology. I mean, if anyone hasn't read it, Tim Marshall's. Uh, prisoners of geography and power of geography with what's going on in Ukraine. Anyway, it's just understanding your, your own mindset, other people's mindset, and surrounding yourself with a point of difference. And I think what I realised, I sweat the detail. I will wring the towel dry of every ounce of sweat. But occasionally I won't necessarily look up and think, where's this going in five years' time? And, it, uh, and I used to think that was a huge weakness. And then I've realized as long as I'm in a boat with someone who's doing the other side of that, then I'm all right. So um, I think that's answered the question. Um, yeah, I'm a detail. I'm an absolute, and it drives people by me. I'm a detail guy partly because of my parents. Um, 
My mum was a maths teacher, so I lived in a maths puzzle every day. My dad wasn't an English teacher, but his mastery of the English language, the speed at which he can do the telegraph cryptic crossword. I mean, his nickname was the Riddler. It speaks in riddles. So I was either locked in a riddle or stuck in a maths puzzle. So everything was trying to beat the game, trying to solve it. And so my brain is coming right. What's the next? What, what am I solving today? I've got to solve things. And um, I'll often find myself doing old maths GCSE papers. Um, yeah, just sit down and just go do some, as opposed to doing Sudoku or stuff like that. Just go find old, because that's how my brain works. Um, so I'm trying to be less that and finding myself becoming more that. So I've done half a GCSE maths paper today for 20 minutes because I had 20 minutes spare to see if I could still solve quadratics and um, understand um, cosine and sine rules and find it, find areas of triangles that are, have no relevance to my kids' upbringing, to my marital status, to my mortgage being paid, but... Um, Give me twenty minutes of great pleasure. Did you did you always have that, or is that something that's been grown post career, or was that during your career you had that your rugby career? Yeah, I was. I always, we uh, my favourite bit of playing for England for eight years. Uh, last five of them, we were at Peniel Park, Bagshot. Can't remember the. They, they don't have room numbers. They have names of flowers at Peniel Park. I think it's like sweet pea or rhododendron. Can't remember what the physio room was with Pusky, Barney Kenny, and Richard Krychek or Vershik, but we couldn't pronounce his surname, so it was easy to call him Krychek. Uh, <laughs> acupuncturist. And training would always have finished by four. And we'd all, about six or seven of us, have a quick shower, head straight back down there for 4.30 for countdown, to play countdown every day with Carol, the good old Carol Borderman. Yeah. Say. Uh, Dawson and Healy uh, and Johnson uh, and who else was always in there Hilly, Richard Hill was always in there uh, Bolshaw and Tinder would come in and their brains would explode after 15 seconds and they'd run back out I know the answer, I know the answer <laughs> for that four letter word, well that's not you know, we won't go yet, anyway well, so, and that's, when they came alive when it was dying of the day or whatever that Xbox game was Goldeneye they came oh, out right, yeah. yeah. And then it was Golden Eye, and then it was three card brag. Um, so we had a routine, I love I love a routine. Um, so yeah, it's it's that's just it's always been oh it's like that, that great film Cocktail with Tom Cruise. It's a very sad film, actually. It's a brilliant film, and Tom Cruise is definitely desperate to be a successful businessman. And he aligns himself with this guy who seems like he's amazing and successful, but quietly behind the scenes is falling apart. And in the end, it's, I won't spoil it, I won't ruin it, but it's, it's desperately sad. But the, the mentor turns up at a bar that Tom Cruise is working at. He's called cocktail, he wants to run bars, wants to run, and he goes, and, he, and I can't, I won't do his accent, he goes, bet you $20 or whatever the bet is that, Behind that counter, there is a management book. And Tom Cruise pulls it out and goes, you still got it, got me. So wherever I go, I mean, I'm never far. Today's current reading is Bedside Book of Algebra. Um, yeah, it really is. From vectors to variables, the ABC of X plus Z. Um, and that... Um, it's fascinating because it's my passion. And the reality is, maths is everywhere. It is, you know, you just think, oh, that's, that's pretty and nice. And it's got the golden ratio of architecture in there, 1.6, whatever it is, according to the length of your elbow down. And it's, it's, in, it's in us. Um, and I just, I'm fascinated about how things are built and put together, and work and operate and puzzles. And that's sort of, even though I'm only a level five coach, it's sort of how I coach 
just give the lads parameters. So these are the basic understanding. This is basic gravity um, principles, ideas. Go, how do we get from here to there? Um, and, but this is, what I've, this, is, this is what I think is, I think I've got quite a good idea that I've been thinking about, but I'm not playing. So take this idea. And I learned that from, well, my dad was a great coach, but Brian Ashton would just give us setups and say, I, I think I'm onto something here. And then we'd take it away. And I would just get a microscope out on it and go, right, how do we tweak it? How do we understand that that works perfectly if everyone's got a perfect right hand pass, perfect left hand pass, and can all run 110.4. But my left hand pass is terrible. Um, Wilco can only run 111.2. Um, Tins doesn't really want to be the distributor. Uh, and therefore, why don't we change what Brian does and just put it together like that? And oh, look, it worked and we scored. Um, and I think. All teams should be underneath the strategy that I've talked about that I haven't created. It's finding little combinations of pairs, twos, threes, four of you who are creating moves and ideas that coaches don't even hear about. They don't need to know. You're mm. just pulling it together within, within or in order to deliver the grander strategy that has been written down on a flip chart and is the five-year plan and you'll take you're taking that on yourself like you would take that sort of that up on your own self to to create that little micro strategy within the the larger strategy that's a conversation you would have yeah. between the guys yeah coaches don't need to know yeah don't need to tell. Clive, didn't need, Clive didn't need to know no there's literally that's what was amazing about it give us ideas um create amazing environments um, and we didn't do it that often, but I mean, there was one time where actually Clive gave us a move. I wasn't totally convinced by it. So we changed everything in the move. I mean, like everything, but we kept the same name of the move. And we scored a bucket full against someone. And I was called sort of shaggy at the time. And he goes, oh, which, that, that second try, I recognise. Which one was it? Yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was Drifter. He goes, ah. Told you it'd work, and the reality is, it bore no resemblance whatsoever to the movie clip. But he didn't care, and he probably knew. But actually, wanted he was brilliant at giving you autonomy uh, and independence, and actual authority to to change, to not ask permission, to just just get it done. I mean, you have you have rules like. You can't go to the pub and have 15 pints a night before a big game. But on the field, um, he was didn't care about the textbook. Just anyway, that's that's why we were lucky as coach. And McGeekin was like that with the Lions in '97. Ashton, my old man, uh, it's what the great coaches do. Um, they don't paint by numbers. Can get you so far. But if a player can't think for himself or make a decision for himself out on the paddock, your team's shot. And it's, if I were to go to rugby in particular, you know a good team when they get awarded a penalty and no one looks to the touchline. You know a team that's really struggling when they get a penalty and the first thing they're looking for is the water boy. So the water boy can tell them, kick for three, kick for corner. Um, because it's... What's, I, I think I've got this phrase slightly wrong, but it's something like the coaches coaches can see things that players can't feel, but players can feel things that a coach can't see. And so I get the GPS systems, I get the drones that are filmed in training, I get all that. But in the heat of battle, if I think an opponent's tired or I think he's just overcommitted on his weight's just on the wrong foot mate the move's out the window 
I'm going to rinse that geezer and we're going to go through and score. Why, why, why am I bothered about a set play when I've got a, a wounded animal in front of me? And that's what the great coaches allow you to do. I, I want to um, touch on that where you were talking about the guys in the that were, would come down and, and watch Countdown and things like that. That is going to be a very different environment to the modern day now. There's so many distractions. There's so many different stimulus for for players. You, you're talking about 97 where there's a lot less technology around and a lot no. less distractions. No, there's no technology. We had a <laughs> there, there, there's no technology. <laughs> I don't know if I kept it. I have done. I'm not sure if I can go to I keep that little crappy thing from the old days. There was a we were given a phone card by Entel, I think. So you could ring and you were given like five pounds worth of credit and you could, you could get an outside line from your hotel room to ring wow. home. you got to remember when I met my missus, I had to ring my mother-in-law's house and say, is Caroline in, please? You know, none of this <laughs> Tinder, none of this swiping. And then You're not getting any of that. Then when I talk about phones, so I remember, um, you know, when I first found out about the Lions, was that I got a letter in the post. You know, there was no Sky Sports News. Well, actually, Sky Sports News was around then. But there was no massive media announcement. You found out if the postman was a day late, you were like 30 lads celebrating, and you were thinking, oh, I'm not going. Then a day later, the post turned up. Oh, I am going. Um, so the weird thing is, I'd like to think, I don't know this young crop that well, but I'd like to think they've got their own version. Everyone has their own version. There's a right, just go, there's a great phrase again. Just because it's old doesn't mean it's good. Does, just because it's new doesn't mean it's better. And, um, you know, when you are coaching younger kids and they go, oh, yeah, it's not like that anymore. It's well, there are some basics that I get we all want to um, reverse sweep for six and do a deal shine. And I, I get that, I get that. But then you, you, there are times when it's like it's 35 to three and the ball might be there to do it. And you might yeah. go for it. But I'm also going, yeah, just this bowler's only got an over left in him. Let's just just survive five balls. Because I know the next change, he's absolutely put. He will only bowl. And it's the same in rugby. It's surviving certain moments, risk reward. Um, I think... Uh, the the kids' mentality, not the England rugby team. This is this is now kids who are twelve, thirteen. Instant gratification, instant fix, hail mary, throw it. Um, but one of the guys we interviewed for a book I wrote was Dave Lewis, turnaround king of Tesco, and we were talking about the ability to trust your gut, and it, trusting your gut is an amazing thing to do if you are in complete control of your basics. And that works in business or in sport. If you are absolutely understand with your supply chain, uh, time to delivery, um, stock, time time to get it on the shelf, whatever it might be, a number of, you know, everything about it and something in the market changes, bam, you can change because you're all these things, you just tweak slightly and it's in. But if it's part of that change, it's just like there is a massive gap that you cannot, will not allow you then, and the, the long and the story the short is, he says, if you trust your instincts and trust your gut, if you're not in control of your basics, then you are just gambling. And you're right, every now and again, you might throw that hell there and it might work, but it will work by luck rather than by uh, application. And um, that's one of the harder things. I think we've gone, I might have taken it slightly, but that's one of the harder things to coach the younger generation and the answer, the, the question I know we're talking about is that their downtime might be very different. I think, and, and you read a lot about them and obviously the obvious examples are Jamie Roberts being a doctor and, and that sort of stuff. You'd like to think just because uh, there is Twitter and Instagram and Xbox that actually some of them will use it in, some of them may not even, well, I know a lot of the lads aren't even on it, but they will find different ways to have their own version of a coffee club uh, and stimulus mm. and, and grey cells being 
uh, asked questions of outside of ruck mall tackle. Mm, I, I don't think there's too. There's it's, it's very hard. Like I've spoken to loads of current athletes that are playing, and and even just some of my friends who are still playing. You 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 just you do exist in a bit of an echo chamber. You do exist in a in a world where you have to blend like how much commitment you're putting towards that sport because there is so much sacrifice you do need to make but then there is that open space that you need in order to have an external focus that allows you to have just that mental break because the the mental the mental stimulus that is around and again most people will probably stay away from Twitter just because of the trolling and just because of the negativity and it is rightly so like it's actually a real detriment to their mental health but being able to blend that i almost don't know where it sits it's i just it's like how many interests do you have outside of sport in order to make sure that you're look at finding that right thing that you you have an interest in so that maybe post career you can then step into it did did you have something that you were foresighting post career like was business something and it was interesting like is that no, something was, that you I was uh, my generation was slightly different in that I did three years sort of A's at A level and um, I nearly was I was nearly chippy about when they when they were actually A's. Um, don't don't be that chippy old fella. Um, uh, and I got two one in economics at Durham University and applied to Midland Global Markets then, which was then acquired by HSBC. So then worked in the city for two and a half years. Um, and very nearly didn't even go pro, very nearly just stayed in the city and uh, went and played at Rosman Park, but decided after a conversation with my old man to go and find out if I was any good. Um, and then, so when I then finished, there were that I, I had been through the process of job applications, of interviews, um, of college, of um, upskilling myself off the rugby pitch. Um, which allowed me to have, and by the way, I'm also not blind to the fact that if you have a big shiny gold medal, there's a few more doors open to you than if you're an epic second place. Um, so put that together and I sort of set off and uh, I was relatively, relatively unscathed mentally when it came to what am I going to do next? Um, uh, and so, yeah, I was on that front, fortunate enough. I think the current crop are in good shape and I do think their well-being and resilience, because I think those sort of two words should always go together because uh, life is tough. You've got to find a way to be resilient. I understand it's all about well-being and, and feeling happy and confident about life. But yeah, to say there are no tough times, I think slightly pulls the wool over people's eyes. Um, so the current lot, I think, are in good shape. I think there was a generation of lads who must have, would have been 16, 17 when rugby turned pro in 1996. And they were like, right, I'm turning pro. I'm finishing college. I'm not going to uni. I'm going straight to an academy. Uh, trained, picked up 40, 50 games for leagues. The league premiership picked up 40 grand a year, 35 grand a year, something like that. Uh, and then got to the end of the career and booted out before people realized that actually, I mean, your t shirt is it human first, athlete second. Uh, that just did that, yeah. It was athlete first, what can you do for this club? If not, you're a waste of space, get off my bum and sheet. Mental health, do one, physical health, not really that bothered about that. Have a quarter zone job, get on with it. Concussion, have a dig, mate. We need you this Saturday. Are you playing? Um, and so I think there was a, in the rush for professionalism and excellence and winning, um, I think the byproduct of that was 10, 15 years of probably lads finishing the end of their career going, I'm not sure that was worth it. Um, what exactly have I got to show for it? And uh, who exactly, who oh, the phones stopped ringing? And, you know, and, and that's, that's where I'm at. So uh, I'm being slightly binary about it in order to have a conversation. Um, but I do think 
I and I hope that I think the key thing in life is I think when people get to my age now, 50 or whatever, or when they're 45, when they finish, I think the, the question I hope everyone answers yes to is were you happy the year you were born? And what I mean by that was, therefore, on the back of the year you were born, the years you played rugby, did you get what you wanted out of it? Did you come out of it as a relatively normal human being and with career prospects after it? And But you were happy and achieved the best of yourself in that allotted time period. And, and again, again, might be too simplistic question, but I can genuinely sit up and go, they could have, they're earning fortunes now, but I would not want to have been born in 1992 and be 31 coming to the end of my career next year. Um, 1972, I got, in my in my mind, I can understand it's a hot air balloon, but someone will, will argue for a different year. In my mind, 1972 allowed me to do everything I wanted at school and university, pick up qualifications flip it, go and have a few years as a pro and come out of it with options. Um, so uh, I hope if you ask the current crop that they would start to say, nah, that old, that old mug, what's he talking about? Way better being born in And that's, that's, <laughs> you just hope it's always good for that individual. Yeah, it takes it takes a lot of awareness from the person to be able to recognise like what their current situation is to to know like okay, am I am I putting too many eggs in this basket? Not enough over here. Um, what from what you've just said, and if you had a young player in front of you now, what would be or is your advice to them? Stay away like, from the chuffing academy. Do not go near a box ticking exercise Look, again. Being binary, slightly argumentative. Uh, joining an academy which clubs have to have in order to get their RFU funding, which they then use for whatever reason they want to use it for. And of the 65 players they pick up at the age of 15, who then they then tell to only do one sport and they take out school matches and they don't let them play club rugby and they end up playing three games a year for an academy. And then they go, actually, salary cap crisis, energy crisis, crisis has come in, uh, HMRC crisis. Don't, parents, if your kid's 15, 16 now and someone says, I think you can be an academy, tell him to do one. Absolutely. Go down your local club, go meet some hedge funders, some plumbers, some bricklayers, go meet life playing the sport you love. And I'll tell you what, if you're good enough, you'll still get there. You don't need to go through that shit to get it. And in the meantime, become one dimensional and everything done for you. Um, yeah. For, and, for, and with the reality that three or four come out of it, and you like might be one of those three or four, I get it, but I'm going to go back to my bedside book of algebra. The odds says it's not you, kid. So uh, I'm not trying to deny people. I hope the arguments come across properly at the end. I just, I think if you're that good, you'll get to the top anyway. And you can get to the top. I think, I'm, I think if, the more you know, the more you laugh. Yeah, uh, yeah. The more you know, the more I you think, laugh. And if you, and you go in, I think academies make dull-ish and again, wow, that is a sweeping generalization. But I went to, where'd I go? Richmond. Time to watch London Scottish play Queens in a pre season game on Saturday. And the lads shall remain nameless. Bumped into three lads who are in academies. Good players, man. I'm telling you, proper players. Last year, combined total number of games played, six. What? D how does that? How does that even? That, how does that even create a sense of knowing how good you are, like or, or confidence in yourself? Like it's, it's so, almost. It's yeah, by the way, and I also understand there'll be someone here who runs an academy and say you picked on three people. It's a straw poll of three. That's incorrect, factually. Uh, the average number of games. So I don't want to necessarily be. I, I, I try to. 
not draw lines in sands and battle lines over this. I tried to have debates about it. I'm just pretty strong on one side of it and need to be convinced of the overwhelming positives that make up for some of these stats and some of these people that feel completely let down by the sport at the age of 25. Yeah, yeah it's rough. And, and you mentioned, uh, I want to take the steering wheel and go a little bit of a, a turn left. And I... You, you mentioned there about resilience being like really important alongside well-being. Now, you have had many challenges in your life and career from 97 tour to, and being knocked out, swallowing your tongue and, and that being a near-death experience um, to 2002 and losing your first son, Freddie, um, prematurely born and, and losing him early. What... I know every every incident has its own nuances and differences. What have you learned about yourself over time and perhaps use as coping mechanisms that you draw upon? So the challenges that you face on a daily basis, what are some of the, I know that everything's nuanced and it, there's different strategies, but if there was something that you've learned about yourself in the way you cope the best, what what would that be? Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, that's such a, Vast canvas of a question. Yeah, I, I recognise that. No, no, I'm, I'm trying to work out what best way to go about it. I think some of my closest would go, he hasn't coached, he didn't coach, he really struggled. Um, and, and, and that's the truth. Um, but if you are then going to work and you are presenting on the telly or you're doing a keynote speech or you're a chief customer officer and you're trying to bring in business. I've learned now that it's okay to contextualize and actually to be up front and say, this is what's going on behind the camera now. But the reality is in the front facing roles you have, you've got to stick a mask on. Uh, can't every time I turn up the Twickenham or whatever on Saturday whilst we're going through those tough periods and just go, especially as a player, oh, All Blacks, can you not, can you give me just a bit of time here because I'm having a tough time or you're on the TV on a Saturday and, and you've just discovered something like everyone does, by the way. We all have, everyone, everyone has crosses to bear. We are very fortunate it, with our ability to be able to cope with it collectively. Um, so the reality is, uh, I haven't and didn't cope with any of those things as well as people maybe think but the sort of show must go on mentality and the role I had or the, the, the profession I had meant that's just you got to get on with it then privately I think the best way to describe it is you, you just you know you got to have a circle of trust you got to have a a group of people and mine and mainly my university mates who at any stage you know it's a psychological safety it's, but it's also not ruinous empathy I know you, you know, they've got you've got to have a group of people around you call you on shit uh, have the have the ability to understand you to understand that we're all doing this for the long-term good or how we perceive it to be. And I think you're acting out of line or I think it's now time to go back to work or to, 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 to address the situation. I, I, I think it's, it's a collective um, thing that is my lesson on it, is that who, who, who are the people? And you might have different groups for different parts of you. You might have a home group who you mates from uni you might have a you might have a work group you don't have to be from your own organization just who am i oh, this is a tough decision now and, and everyone's trying to reinvent the wheel themselves and actually if you can go to someone who's tightening at it and pick up a phone and say i just need five minutes and get that sort of relation which not just ask 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 the whole time so i hope i'm answering a little bit of the question mm. um, that that sort of collective body system that might be very different for the problem that you are facing um, is, is, is critical for us all to have because 
I think if you try and do it all on your own and in, in your own noggin, um, you, you literally could, it could, those sorts of things can drive you insane. I think you've na- nailed it with the fact that you said you, well, a lot of people will give an answer around that of saying like, go and talk to people. And yes, talk to people. That's the sort of overarching message you're sending there. But one thing that I have found really impactful for me, whether it's from anything from dealing with retirement to dealing with an injury to dealing with a relationship, whatever it might be, the accountability from someone that you know to actually hold hold you account to say, now hold on, why not? You can think like this, or perhaps you're maybe misinterpreting that thought, that feeling, that emotion, and and maybe look this way. And sometimes, because you you go to people hoping they're going to tell you the thing that you you want to hear, that that <laughs> yeah. you just want to feel good. But but to have that person to go to call you on it, it's it's a those are valuable people. Like they're super valuable people, and I think you you've nailed it by by saying saying that. So uh, thank thank you for sharing that. Um, Look, I'm really cautious of time, and I caught an interview you'd done before about saying around. I'm sure you get tons of people talking about the the World Cup win and how amazing that must be. And I don't really want to touch on that, like as uh, because I'm sure people can go and find that elsewhere. But I heard an interview you say where if if Johnny Wilkinson had missed that goal, um, you'd have still been happy because of the memories. Yeah, because of the memories, and yeah. and I I really love that. And it it sort of talks to the whole not not the cliche trust the pro enjoy the process part of it but enjoying the 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 memory of and and playing sport to create memories, um and and I also then want to sort of shift that onto you've recently just finished the festival of sport, mm. and is that sort of a a passion or embedding that idea of creating memories through sport and and I because I think it, people lose that they they lose it being this goal-driven orientation and leaning on a little bit of what you've said there around you're not always going to be the one so yeah. why not play it to create the memories the connections with people so when i had um I, I was at a wedding a couple of weeks ago it's a guy there played for northampton saints i didn't even realize him he's called andy newman we were chatting about stuff and he's a property developer now and again we might be re-engineering the facts to fit the story here but he says um Go on, name the Northampton side that won the European Cup in 2000 years, Monster. And I'm an anorak. I am a, I was like, yeah, 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 no problem. Dawson, injured. Grayson Flower, no, played fullback. What? Who played Flower? What? Ali Hefer? Marlon in the centre? What? Really? Craig Moyer? Uh, it's a, a team that, like, he goes, he says my point exactly. He says, but, um, the mates I made and the teams I, and, the, and the fun I had. So there, I, I'm trying to make sure I can articulate the point exactly here that um, it's sort of, it's nice to have the medal. I get all that. But it's not what I remember. Um, what I remember is a very average team coming together in 1997 and setting out on a journey that had some absolute howlers in it. Always talking about and thinking about It'll take a great team to beat us, make the right calls at the right time, put ourselves in a position with the chance to take the shot. And we did everything we could to, to get the right bloke in the right position at the right price to commit the skill that we knew he could sort of do in his sleep. Um, and, and that's sort of the culmination, because getting to that moment is everything you've worked for. Actually, afterwards, it all becomes a little bit of a blur. You all lose sight, a bit of focus. I did post World Cup, got lucky to. Clive should have shaken the hands of 10 people in that change and said, Thanks very much. No need. You're not going any further. That, he would, that, that would have him being kind. That would have been him being kind. Um, again, trying not to go off on a tangent, but I think I, and I'm not trying to take this down the route of early onset dementia in any way, shape, or I can't remember. A minute at work. I sort of can because I've got a photo behind me and I go, but I put together memories from clips I've seen and stuff. But I can take it to Penny Park in 1998, the rowing sessions. I could be out on the back pitch when we trained at Sandhurst, Phil Lada training session. I can remember the first time Brian and Ashton introduced us to this. I can remember the forwards having a massive fight. Um, 
me telling Josh Lucy to poke it and him nearly swinging for me. I, I, I can remember the process there. And that's, and, and, and getting in a position mentally, that you're right, we could have lost that World Cup final, in a position mentally where genuinely there was a 12 month period where we'd have taken anyone on in any place, in any backyard, in any weather. In fact, pick the best of all of you and we'll still beat you. Um, and that's, that's what, not when I close my eyes, I don't do that very often, but yeah, metaphorically, that's when I try to close my eyes and go, what was it about that team? It, and, and that's why I talk about it almost didn't matter because still what I would remember would, would be would be those um, those moments. I've, I've gone off on there. What was the second part of the question? No, you you pretty much you're pretty much on track in the fact in the fact that you're you're talking about these these nuances, these these real idiosyncratic moments within your time of training or being oh, it's not on the field. Festival of sport. Yeah, so sport. just just that that's just inspired whether all of this yeah. memory building has inspired that movement so, that you've you've created. Uh, you don't want to know the PL on the first two years of festival sport. You don't want to know where the balance sheet is on that. It was the, t- this year year two was all right. Year one was a tidy little check that the three owners had to write to make sure that everyone was paid. Uh, and that's what happens in business. Uh, you, you hopefully build, 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 and we'll make some calls on year three and growing it. But if it's stopped now and it's been two expensive weekends, they've been the best weekends I've had in the last two, two, two years. I've, I've sort of, we've created this magical thing where no one's judged on a sports pitch. You can turn up and try. You'd have to check the terms and conditions, but I'm going to say you can try actually any sport that's ever existed. Now, clearly they're not all there, but we had 26 sports, including medieval sword fighting. Um, and we had able, disabled, um, inclusive, neurotypical, neurodiverse. We had superstar elite kids supporting kids who never seen a hockey stick or a lacrosse stick in their life before. We had, again, anonymously, we had sons of, I was going to say billionaires, but not not far short, alongside foster kids. And no one would, no one would, it, it all disappears on a sports pitch. It all, it's all gone, man. Um, leads up by the white line. Welcome. Uh, and coaches who really understood that mentality. And, you know, the strap line is no one's left on the bench. Um, those sorts of things, what I love. And I lived in a festival sport in my house, because mum and dad, I, I, I was, you know, in my village in Earth's Green, was my own little fiefdom of sporting excellence with Adam Ayerst and Paul Ayerst and um, Youngs and Bartons and Holders from my little village that would meet after school and boot a ball about, uh, or be at boarding school and straight after lessons finished into the yard for yard cricket. The three stumps painted on the wall at the back end of Evans' out yard, had a slight slope, worked with my little go wide of the crease, band lethal, got there, nip into the fives court, stick a couple of gloves on, get the hard ball. Fives is a game like squash, but with gloves. Whack those around, get up, get punished, Go and have to get a brass rubbing before breakfast. Look back on that resilience and all that sort of stuff. Probably banned nowadays. Um, a brass rubbing, by the way, is getting a piece of paper on the top of a trig point on the top of a hill with a piece of pencil, which you do in geography. But we had to do that before breakfast if you'd been naughty. It's a decent hill. Um, that's why they breed them tough and said. But um, so I think there's a responsibility. Uh, I, Austin, Healy, and myself, we're, we're not martyrs, you know, but. We realise the value it brings to, to people and we realise that it might just change people's lives and they might become slightly fittier, slightly healthier. They might become elite. It actually doesn't matter. Um, we just both believe sport and teamship and collective endeavour should be an absolute must in absolutely every single person's lifestyle. And if I can sign up for petitions that say, bring more PE back to school, or if I can oh. rock, if I can Amen. rock 
do school hard knocks in underprivileged areas with lads who just come out of prison, but I'm not going to judge them. I'm going to, I'm going to treat them how they treat me. I'm going to give them a second chance or you're going to follow the Timpsons model and support ex-offenders to get work. You know, again, all those sorts of things. If we can use sport uh, to help people get back on the social ladder in any way, shape or form, be it sort of um, financially or, or perhaps even because you've been discriminated against, whatever it is, is... Um, I think it's. To, I get there'll be people who could come on here and talk about an orchestra, join an orchestra, or join a dance. I, I get that. I just I, I'm always going to beat the, the, the sporting drum supremely loudly, and um, it's given me absolutely everything. And I've got a kicking session tonight with a young lad at Maidenhead who might play in the first team on Saturday. I think we've got London Marsh at home. We might pick him up, fly half. He's a lovely lad, South African kid. Greg wants to be the best. Got his. I hope he doesn't listen. This is kicking games a five out of ten. So tonight, my youngest lad will come out and catch the balls, and we'll go do a session for an hour when no one's watching away from the bright lights and try and help a lad be the best version of himself on Saturday. And it might work, it might not work, but uh, I'm not going to stop trying. I love it. I think people need to listen to more of what you're doing and what you've done in the past like you mentioned school of hard knocks like that work the philanthropic work you're doing and, and it's it, it's that willingness to give back to sport it's to take the lessons learned from it recognize that this game whatever game you're playing actually teaches you more than just the skill set that's needed on the field and i think you're probably leaning on a lot of those skill sets that you've learned in teams and on the field in the work that you're doing now and that's where it's valuable I, i've always said that's where businesses and people outside of sport find those people really interesting to listen to and learn from because they 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 hear of these skill sets but in reality just put your kids into sport get them to in, thrive in it go go fall over a few times and stand up again and just get going and that would be i know i valued I, i've gained value from it and and i attribute a lot of myself and my values in the world to to what it has come from from sports so yeah great job in what you're doing i'm sure you hear it all the time please don't stop and anyone listening go and find will and i'll leave a load of links in the show notes for people to find you on social media your websites and and all such but just before we finish because i'm very cautious of time and you've been really generous with it um my hair, i've got a three o'clock haircut and you know i'm not going <laughs> as short as you but it's, it needs to no no <laughs> yeah um is 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 there a, a book, a quote, or something that you're recommending people a lot at the moment that's had an impact on you? So two things. This, two things. One, I wrote a book. This isn't about, but I wrote a book with my best mate, and it allowed me. And I know lockdowns don't happen all the time but writing things down. And we didn't actually care if 500 people bought the book or 50,000, that actually done all right. We wrote a book, World I'll Class. Link that. Uh, and I picked up the phone with so many people, so many people, and we chatted to, uh, I'm just going back, chatted to Sir Dave Brailsford. Um, we chatted to, Jeremy Derrick, CEO of Sky, Dana Strong, current CEO of Sky, but when she was at Comcast, Phil Jansen, CEO of BT, we chatted to, you know, the, the list literally goes on, Dan Carter, uh, Kate and Helen Richardson Walsh, Helen, Helen Glover. Mm. Uh, it was just so much fun. And, and you'd be surprised how many people, if you want to learn or you want to do something, will return your call. Uh, so... One of the things is don't stop knocking on doors. Don't stop picking phones up. Um, I think there is a, a willingness from most high achievers to want to support and impart in some way those who are trying to pull themselves up by their bootstraps or upskill themselves. So never be afraid of asking politely. Um, so there's two messages in that. One is never be afraid of asking politely. And two, if you ever get the chance, write your own. You don't have to write a book. But what do you stand for? What gets the best out of you? Uh, yeah. What irritates you? I mean, I mean, have those written down. You turn up at work, hand them out. You know, yeah. this is me. Uh, I'm a Man City fan. If you're late for a meeting, you're dead to me. Um, 
uh, always check in, always check out, ask twice, just various little bits and pieces that, that I have, which are a part of me. And then I suppose if you had a phrase, love, love phrase is the other one I've got. Every time I come across a good phrase, a good quote, I write it down. And it might be a brilliant one some, from someone who's um, a businessman that you wouldn't have heard of, really, Jim Carroll. Just really clever little things. Great leaders are gardeners and not mechanics. Just tiny little things like that. So I write these down when I get out. What does that mean? That means you're trying to create the soil and the weather and the conditions for your people to be great. You're not in there turning the wrench yourself. Mm. It's just a really clever way of putting it. And... Um, the one I have, because I know the Zoom calls back, the one I absolutely stand by now, which I'd like to think I did as a kid, but I look back on it and go, yeah, maybe not. Mark Twain said, if you only tell the truth, you don't have to remember anything. <laughs> and uh, I am unapologetically truthful. Uh, I can't say I was always that, um, but that's who I am now at work on a sports pitch. Sometimes it takes people by surprise, but it's just, this is what I'm seeing, this is what I'm thinking. And you're asking me a direct question, that's my answer. Because you've seen me lose track of what I've said before. And if I've lied, I'll probably say something else. But if I'm just telling the truth, you'll always get the authentic me. Absolutely love that. I think that's a perfect place to end this. Look, Will, you've been uh, so generous and, uh, and I've loved this. Thank you so much for giving your time. Um, I'm glad we were able to to get it done. And um, like I've mentioned, I'll, I'll link everyone to to find you, learn more. I know you're a patron of many different things, so people can learn loads loads more there. But thank you so much for your time, and uh, good good luck with the haircut. <laughs> yeah, short back in size. I'm not, I've, I've tried a very different things over the past ten years. Um, starting September is back to sort of work, real work mode back on a nice businessman smart haircut. No, you you take care. Thank you so much. Take Good it easy. Boss. Cheers, Tell me.